And uh, this is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, June 29th, 2023. Um, we are in check-in mode this week and Doug was just telling me about a ship that is docked in the harbor nearby in Montenegro where he is living for a while. Um, first, I need to turn on the transcript and now we're off and running. Uh, so I'm thinking this is a natural segue into our uh, check-in round and I'll just explain the check-in protocol which we've been using, the S protocol, which is I'm going to step out of the conversation for a while Please use the Zoom hand raise to raise your hand when you'd like to step into the queue to check in. Uh, please check in only once during the check-in portion, then when we're all done checking in or passing, uh, we will choose a topic to go into. Uh, don't, don't drop your hand until you're done talking so that we stay sort of uh, in our focal point, otherwise you'll fall into the chaos of the, the gallery view. Uh, so that's just a tiny note. And also, um, when it's your turn, the, the, the hands raised display is the same for all of us, meaning the queue looks, the, looks alike for everybody, so you'll know where you are uh, next in line. And when you uh, are next up, please unmute yourself so that we know that you know that you're next. But take a moment to step into the conversation because we have figured out that pausing is really good for our conversations. So having explained the protocol, I will step out of uh, hosting until we're all sort of done checking in, uh, unless people arrive and they don't know what's up. And I'll pass the mic to Doug. Well, what's really on my mind is the crazy event of Zuckerberg, Lex Fridman, and Elon Musk doing judo together, uh, serious. Uh, and I think, what does the world come to if the presidents of leading corporations are spending their time throwing each other on the mat? Uh, if, think if they had spent their time writing poetry or reading history, uh, we might be better off. But it's, in a way, it's a joke, these three guys judoing with each other. There are videos online, so you can see them all. Uh, but what does it say about our leadership and the state that the country is in if it has leaders who are spending the time doing this? Uh, end, of, end of check in. Shall I go next? Please do. Okay. Um, I was catching up last night on um, all the OGM emails and uh, the one I that struck me quite a bit uh, that I think about this morning is uh, the one from uh, Gil Friend on AI, uh, chat GPT, and it's... Um, potential for analytical thinking. And um, I was grateful that uh, uh, he made it possible. Let's see, was that from Gil? Uh, I think it was originally from somebody else maybe, but um, I was grateful that uh, I could uh, get a copy of it and uh, I intend to use it. Uh, so thank you very much. And that's it for me.
Okay, this is a slow start this morning. <clears throat> so I'm I'm uh, really struggling to maintain my emotional balance because, uh, like most everyone here, I'm I'm so dialed into what uh, is happening in the in the in nature you know, around the globe, and it is just really frightening. Uh, because it's running at a pace that uh, that we still haven't processed. Now it uh, um, it's first of all irreversible. You know, these these changes are uh, accelerating exponentially, and the challenge really is to have people understand this. And um, there was a hearing in the Senate with JBS, you know, is one of the largest meat producers uh, in the world. Um, controls about 25% of the U.S. meat market, and uh, the Oregon senator has uh, has uh, done an investigation on them and the way they bypass um, sourcing meat from uh, the Amazon regions that comes from uh, places cleared of uh, of the rainforest is by. Uh, originating animals in cleared, uh, illegally cleared forests, then transfer them to a farm for a few days that is in compliance, and then certify the origin of the animal to that farm. So long story to explain that these multinational companies absolutely refuse to uh, accept you know, their responsibility in, in uh, uh in in reducing the damage uh, they're doing so um it is it is uh it is an in, an incredible challenge and the only way that you can really uh overcome that or or, or surround that is by localizing food you know you go local and regional and change productions but in order to do that uh, the challenge then really is to explain that and to to engage the local population, uh, not just the, the decision makers, but really to have the local nonprofits and and uh, social uh, uh, groups uh, understand this in a constructive, positive, actionable way. So I've been. Uh, working with the Kiss the Ground group now, they gave me a license so I can used the movie in in uh in uh educational settings and i'm working on um on a an outline where we take the educational component of the kiss the ground movie which uh, is only 45 minutes but it really just explains soil you know, and the importance of of uh, soil life the microorganisms inside the soil and the title of uh the, uh, the uh, discussion uh, I want to create is kiss the ground, dot, 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 and then do what? Now, because, you know, so, okay, so now that we all understand, you know, this is, and, and people are really moved by the movie. It's very emotional. You know, it's very, it really, it really penetrates, um, particularly, you know, for all the you know, uh, social groups here. And so I found a local restaurant, uh, a, a microbrewery actually, uh, giving us their, their their banquet room for free, and the owner is very uh, engaged in in environmental um, in in sourcing from regenerative uh, uh, farmers. So the the hope is, uh, Gilda. The title is "Kiss the Ground." Dot dot dot, and then do what? Right, because "Kiss the Ground" the movie. Um, is is widely uh, under uh, known they have over two million showings i mean they they uh they really had a very wide audience they are now working on a sequel or they already have released a sequel that will come out uh, in a few weeks and so the, the 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 using this movie you know as an impetus to say okay so what are we going to do about this you know and then come come forth with really actionable items that show the importance of bioregions you know working within the, the environment that you that you have uh, that uh, attention over that you see you know, where you know the farmers you know the processes you know what it's coming from, um, but the the 
the, the, um, the pace of change in the environment, the, the, uh, the risk to the food supply, you know, there, there are no, no more reserves anywhere, then there's nothing left in storage, right? So we completely, last year was a fiasco in, in uh, uh, losing yields around the world. The Yangtze River dried up, you know, Spain dried up. Uh, so many, I mean, really global impacts uh, of, of uh, uh, environmental impacts, I mean, of environmental uh, disturbances on the food supply. We're just not talking about it, and we're not we're not really aware of it. But this is this is this has the the risk of of creating migrations in the millions of people, right? Because when you when your food runs out, then what people what are people going to do? So so anyway, <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to 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 find uh, a lever, you know, where you can engage people at an emotional level with um in in ways that 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 you can actually do something you now and 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 act upon you now and I, i'm i get uh this reuters has these huge events you now all the companies are involved we're talking at the top level you know and and the solutions that are being proposed are top down instead of bottom up so we need to shift to to we need to create uh top-down, bottom-up uh, uh, dynamics that bring that bring this energy together. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of rambling here, but I tell you, I am like really scared. You know, this is, uh, I, I just know too much. <laughs> it's just, it, it disturbs your sleep. You know? Well, I'll I'll hop in on that cheery note. Thank you, Klaus. Um, uh, I woke up this morning all pumped for five minute university, so I'm standing down on that. I'll wait till next time for that. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I have not been a a climate doomer, um, um, extinction guy. I'm, I've not been somebody who says it's it's over. Let's surrender. But the signs are becoming increasingly clear that we're headed for an enormous amount of shit. Um, and I find myself thinking a lot, <clears throat> not just about the biological part of that, but the political part of it and the political chaos that's going to ensue as more and more people realize uh, what a mess we're in. Um, and I've had this weird prediction for a long time, I'll make put it on public record here, that there will come a point where the Republicans will run on a climate platform denouncing the Democrats for inaction, which of course they themselves block. So mark my words, you can hold me to it. We can make bets on the side and see when that will happen. I predict that will happen. Um, on a more um, um, uplifting and maybe interesting note, um, uh, Ken and I have been having some discussions lately about uh, the diversity of the crowd in our living between worlds conversations, and I know we've had that one here as well. Um, um, and I woke up this morning with a couple of very different thoughts about the question, um, about what we've been calling a problem, but that it's maybe not a problem. And I thought about it in, in these regards. One is that um, nobody tells an artist that they need to change their art in order to broaden their audience. Actually, some people do. They're, you know, the record company executives might tell them that. But an artist does what they do, and they attract who they do, and the audience broadens or doesn't over time. Either does or doesn't. Um, and um, I don't mean to be self-inflating by calling us artists, but we, you know, can you and I um, have some things to say? And maybe the job is just to say them. Uh, and see what happens rather than work hard on broadening the audience. And the related thought is that there used to be a thing called affinity groups. 
uh, people here are old enough to remember them and people would gather around common interests and the common interests uh, were sometimes, but not necessarily related to physical, biological, genetic ad identity, but were sometimes related, you know, certainly you know, women's groups would have that character. Uh, but there were other affinities that called people together. And so I just want to put in a soft vote for that, that as we consider DEI um, in the biological dimension, that we'd be open to it in other dimensions. Um, and that's what I got this morning. Um, uh, yesterday and at various other times, uh, Pete and I and others have had a conversation about uh, shared memory and whether it's possible, how it works, why have it, uh, a bunch of other things. And I'm right this moment, I'm, I'm forgetting the details of our conversation, but um, it's a conversation that sort of uh, both frustrates and excites me because I've been I've had my hair on fire for quite a while about god damn it we need to have a shared memory so that we know what we know so that we can solve some problems together and by this I don't mean a canonical answer to every question known to mankind that we all agree on through consensus because I don't think that's actually even possible but rather I mean a space that we refer to and keep improving where we ref where we can answer some of these questions but we can also see other people's answers to similar questions because the, the more or less consensus view in this room about climate change and what to do about it. And, and I'm not sure we could arrive at a consensus, but I think we would be broadly agreed in our points of view on that here uh, is really quite different from people who are like, ah, ice ages have happened before. This is just, you know, the, the earth will heal itself, whatever else it is. And I'm really interested in building some resources that let us not have the same arguments over and over again, I think is one of the benefits of a shared memory. And um, have a space within which we can uh, complexify the different questions that are in front of us, uh, figure out who's got the best answers to different parts of it, uh, write narratives and stories that are emotional rather than factual around this, these things, a little bit like we're doing in the Neo Book uh, project on Mondays with Klaus and others uh, and Patty. Um, and so it's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested in anybody's thoughts or opinions about whether such a space is possible or desirable. Um, uh, one of the sort of threads that wove its way into those conversations was in when ChatGPT got hot a couple months ago, uh, one, uh, several people posted things like, ah, note taking is so passe. We should all stop taking Tiago Forte's building a second brain course because uh, we're just going to consult the oracle that now can speak back to us and think in whole sentences. It used to just like spit out things it found. Now it can actually tell us about what it found. Uh, we don't need to do note taking anymore. And I think that's a as big a mistake as outsourcing our memory to Google and Wikipedia was uh, a couple decades ago, which seems to be what we did. Um, so uh, interested in all thoughts on the notion of shared memory, how to explain it, uh, how you see the needs or whatever. And I am, I remain like really convinced that 
we need a place to sort of uh, pin things. Uh, call it just a pin board for important stuff, but important stuff that doesn't sit in isolation, but rather is pinned in relationship in a web of connections, because these are thorny problems. They are systems of problems. Uh, there's a French word, problématique. Uh, Russell Acuff, uh, an early systems theorist, I happened to get lucky and, and take some courses from him at Penn. <clears throat> and one of the first things he would say is that the French have a word we don't have. This is problématique, which means systems of problems, because uh, very few problems exist in isolation. Uh, mostly, they are interconnected and interrelated and inter interwoven. And you have to then take a solution approach that touches many different parts of a system if you're going to have an effect on the whole system, was one of his conclusions. So that's what I'm. That's my check-in for right now. I'm, I'm just pondering that heavily because I remain an advocate of shared memory, hive mind, collective intelligence, collaborative sense making, whatever <laughs> term you'd like to give it. I think this is a possibility, and not just a possibility, but a civilizational necessity if we're going to make it through the eye of the needle, the thin passage, the event horizon of the singularity, whatever the hell you want to call this moment that we're living through right now together. So I, I, I almost dropped out of the queue um, because Jerry, you were going someplace else. And then and then you you did the perfect segue <laughs> for one of the things I wanted to say. Um, I'm reading a wonderful book called The Spiritual Autobiography of the Dalai Lama. Um, and you know, I got the link to it through reading some other book about. A peaceful heart. Um, but I just read this morning about the Dalai Lama talking about interdependence. <laughs> and what a lot of people don't realize, and, and by the way, the book is extraordinary because it really bottom lines Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science. You know, m many people think of Buddhism as, as a a religion, and it has that aspect. It has that aspect of of um, the religious piece, but he beautifully distinguishes spirituality from religion, and also goes into the scientific, psychological, you know, underpinnings of of Buddhist thinking, and it's just an extraordinary book. I commend it to um, to everyone's reading. Because in 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 my own thinking, you know, um, we know what to do. Uh, we just haven't developed the will or awareness of doing it. Um, when Klaus, when you were speaking about um, all the folks in um, doing nasty stuff, um, they're just following their own conditioning. I mean, this is the notion of compassion. They've been, you know, told to be good capitalists and that all they need to do is make money. And that's the mantra that they're following. Um, and I, I, I kind of remember when I was trying to have an impact on the legal profession and was running around ranting and hating all lawyers. And then I realized that eh, they're just playing inside their game that they've been conditioned to follow. So that's just a different perspective. I'm not saying it's right. But I'm just saying that's that's what's that's what's that's what's going that's what's what's going on. Um, answer seems to be heading in the right direction, so that's a good thing. Um, I've actually got some you know um, energy back. It's 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 uh, blood counts are going in the right direction. Um, it feels like an amazing um, and actually quite wonderful spiritual journey um, to 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 move through this slice of time and a journey of proactivity in terms of, you know, not just accepting carte blanche, what the medical community says, but being um, proactive and engaged in, um, in care. Um, you know, it's kind of like, 
<laughs> instead of waiting till my doctor gives me permission to go to Africa for three weeks in October, <laughs> I decided to tell him that I was going and let's figure out how to make that work. <laughs> so that's kind of a little bit of a, a, a bottom a bottom line. Of course, I won't do anything that's dangerous. Um, I decided to um, combine three areas of writing into a new, what will probably be an ebook, um, uh, a little fable about what we could do, um, areas that I think need addressing in the world, my um, conflict resolution um, and agreement models, and I'm calling it getting to relationship um, as kind of a, uh, an overview, because that's what I think we need. And um, I want to read a poem as part of my check-in um, today. Um, it's called Kinship, and it's today's poem. And I, and I think it's just just really um, what we what we all need. Kinship keeps us alive, holds us together, intact, no matter weather. Brings sunshine, <clears throat> sends away pain, no matter barometer or forecast rain. Holding a hand, kissing a lip, catches you with a startle or blip. Darkest nighttime, blackest hour, presence, a sparkling meteor shower. Amazing, simple, hearts connected, love connections feel respected. Connected meanings are a source, <clears throat> wide smile on your face, of course. Sense of traction, feeling held, holding together, perfect meld. Infinite variety, yours for taking, crosses boundaries, it's generating. Bridges ethnicity, religion, race, underlying lattice, our grace. When feeling down, alone, loving kinship draws you home. I've spoken. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, good thoughts and beautiful poem. Uh, I've been away for a while. Uh, among other things, I spent 10 days in uh, Tuscany, uh, eating delicious food, drinking delicious wine, and taking part in a philosophical retreat uh, about transatlantic and intercultural thinking. Learned a little bit about trying to think like an ocean. But uh, that's not really what I wanted to uh, do my check-in about. I prefer to segue into what Jerry was talking about, shared memory, uh, creating spaces and resources to solve problems together. Uh, since I got back from Italy, I've been taking up one of my uh, uh, standard passions, uh, the idea of how to understand and work with distributed collective intelligence, of course, for solving problems, for making the world a better place. And I've been specifically thinking about uh, the lived experience of thinking together and the lived experience of learning, uh, whether OGM calls like this are experiences of collective thinking or experiences of networked thinking or networked learning. And if that's so, what's coming out of them? Every person on the call gets something individual out of them. I get a lot out of it when I'm able to take part. But is there a kind of collective thinking or collective learning that comes out of it? I think that relates to what Jerry was asking about uh, shared memory. Um, and I've been specifically thinking about this in terms of an article I'm co-writing at the moment about uh, creating shared context. The Japanese word is ba, 
a shared context uh, for network thinking and network learning. Uh, one of the questions I was asking myself, which I thought I might ask this group today, does anyone have any experience of taking part in calls like this when there's also an avatar of someone else uh, taking part in the call, a kind of AI intelligence of a great thinker or an interesting thinker of the past who's not on this call, be it an Einstein or an Archimedes, and having that person's avatar also reacting to what we've been saying. Those are the things that are on my mind, and I'd certainly welcome any feedback other people have on that. Thanks. <laughs> I hesitate to go um, uh, because I like the check-in format, and I especially like when the check-ins check-ins are disjoint, um, not about the same thing. Um, because if they are too much about the same thing, it ends up being a conversation, which we do a lot, um, and then we single track. Um, Zoom has a new thing. It says it's going to lower my hand for me. Um, uh, but I wanted to respond a little bit to Jerry or, or, or check in, um, in, in some way about some of the stuff that Jerry and I have talked about over the past couple of weeks. And I wanted to start with stocks and flows. Um, uh, we, we know that flowing is like water and a stock is like a place where water accumulates or maybe it's um, material in a, in a factory or something like that. Um, I feel like I, I had kind of an epiphany because my passion is for very stock-like uh, things called wikis. Um, and I have to put a little asterisk there. Uh, part, of, part, of the, part of my wiki experience way, way, way back in the early 2000s uh, with my wiki company was that we could have a very, very slow moving conversation in the wiki. So the wiki was not just a stock, it was actually a flow just at a time scale of months and years rather than minutes and seconds and maybe hours. So, but anyway, stocks and flows. Um, uh, the folks here are pretty familiar with knowledge bases or wikis or um, uh, collections of documents, things that are very stock-like. Um, we're also familiar with books um, and writing and reading. Um, and for, you know, 500 years or something like that, we've had a tradition of taking a flow, like a conversation, and crystallizing it into a, a book, a written book, um, or a letter or something like that. And then being able to take that and read it, turn it back into a flow. So humans have done this, this weird technology trick for a thousand years or something like that, where we can pretend that we're having a flow conversation, um, except that it's over time or with people who aren't in the same place as we are. And I think the, the people in this room, the people of a certain age have kind of like grown up with that and, and, and maybe we're some of the last people that will grow up with that, but we've, we've grown up with that as a constant and a, and a bedrock and as a bedrock principle that there's talking, which is cute and stuff like that. And then there's writing, which is permanent and, and travels around the world and does important things. Um, and I, I kind of feel like my epiphany this past couple of weeks was that that is really an illusion that that primacy of the, the stock, um, the written word 
uh, is is a real illusion, and that people people only work with flows. Um, you can kind of trick your your human brain into doing this this technological trick with the text and the the book and the reading and the writing and stuff like that, but it's a pretty hard trick. Um, and I think I'm here to say that. Mm -hmm. A few people learn how to do that trick and a few, few people learn how to do that trick well. But even the, I think the people who are good at it, um, if we're not careful, we fall back into doing flow. So another thing I'm here to say is that that, that presumption that we have that the written word is the most important thing or that academics is the most important thing, that's kind of bullshit too. Um, so when I say that, even, even us, we can fall back into this flow state. I think, you know, that's being human. I think humans have been doing flow state conversation for uh, tens of thousands of years. We're really good at it. Our brains do it naturally. Um, our brains come wired that way when you're a little kid, uh, your brain kind of knows how to talk. Um, uh, and you get shaped by the people conversing around you, but your brain is primed to do this flow thing. So flow is really the way people work. Flow is really the way people convince each other of things. Flow is really the way that you have an emotional connection with other people. It's all about flow. And this stock thing that we've, we've kind of exalted is, is a passing fad. Um, uh, so this is a rationalization for me, um, partly uh, because I've, spent decades of my life working on this, this stock um, mechanism, wikis. And I really like wikis um, and they're really important to me. But I also find that, you know, starting up massive wiki recently, um, it's hard to get people to, to consider a wiki. It's hard to, um, it's hard to get people to write. It's hard to get people to read stuff. Um, and I think in the past, you know, 20 years with the advent of the internet, um, what we see are the natural places people gravitate to is back to flows. So Twitter is a flow, um, uh, TikTok is a flow, Discord is a flow, Slack is a flow, Mattermost is a flow. So one of Jerry's consternations is like, oh my God, we're doing all this flow stuff. A Zoom call is a flow. We're doing all this flow stuff. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a shared memory? So a shared memory is kind of, it kind of gets to the level of being a stock. Um, and kind of what I ended up telling with Jerry was that we have the systems to create stocks. We have the systems to create knowledge bases or written, written um, versions of our flows that we, you know, that course through our, our, our flow state, um, soil health or climate change or um, social justice or something like that. It's not that we, we don't have the tools. Um, it's not that the tools are particularly hard to use, asterisk. The, the tools are hard to use because stocks are hard. Writing is hard, reading is hard. And it's a technological trick that, that we've learned that we think is really useful. It's really hard. So Jerry says, well, Wikipedia, Wikipedia is a wiki. Wikipedia is this big stock. It's super popular. Why don't, you know, why don't we just do what Wikipedia did? And my answer is for the, you know, for the 99.9% .9 of the people who are using Wikipedia, they're not using it as a stock. You don't go to Wikipedia and you don't read 100 pages at a time about metallurgy or about um, social justice or about something like that. That's a thing that people don't do. The thing that people do is they go to Google or their favorite search engine and they type in, um, you know, social justice, Wikipedia or something like that. Um, and they consult a stock by using essentially a chat interface to a big knowledge base. Google's, Google's front end essentially is a keyword kind of chat that, that we've learned how to use. <clears throat> and we're getting chat GPT now that's gonna replace that keyword thing with actual language, but it's kind of the same thing. So, <clears throat> the, so, so the thing that we ended up, or I ended up saying maybe is that, um, these stock-like 
knowledge bases, brains, thinking, you know, thinking reservoirs are actually important <clears throat> and they're valuable and they're useful and they make us smarter. <clears throat> and the way that they get built is not by making a space that then gets filled up. Um, you know, Wikipedia, you could think of Wikipedia as having made the space to fill up with an encyclopedia articles. The technology was an enabler, but that's not the key to it. The key to it is enough investment in creating the information within the container. And that investment in time and energy to do that, converting flows, various flows into a stock is a heavy lift. It's a big deal. It's, it's, it's what we've started calling sense doing. It's a few people sitting down and doing a flow thing together or one person sitting down and doing a flow thing to the world, you know, I'm going to write down something into the world. That's what Klaus is kind of doing with his soil health right now. And in the, um, uh, in the successor to Sense Doing, the Neobook project. Um, it's a lot of work, it's hard work. And it gets harder when you wanna do something smarter. You, uh, a genius author sits down for, for five or 10 years to write a really important book. When you have a few people writing a book together because they know the, the the subject really well, just the coordination of that gets hard, harder and harder and harder. So we have this illusion that if we just make a massive wiki or if we just make an empty Wikipedia, it would fill up because people love to keep track of stuff. Uh, so my, in conclusion, my thing is that's not true. You have to, you have to invest a lot of time and energy into doing that. And um, I think, I think my, I have a, I have a guess that my, my hypothesis is that Wikipedia was largely written in spare time um, uh, by grad students or high school kids or retired people or um, productive procrastinators who were supposed to be doing something else. That's how we got so much effort to build Wikipedia. And so the, the thing that we haven't been doing within OGM is carving off some kind of investment in, in time and energy to take our flows and turn them into a, a valuable stock. And you can't just kind of divert the flow into a stock and just have it accumulate there. That doesn't count. You actually have to digest the, the stuff in the flow and organize it and, and partition it and, and add value to it. You have to sense do around it. And so, you know, we, we save all our chats, we save uh, all our transcripts. They mean nothing to us because they haven't been, um, they haven't been uh, groomed into something that's a useful stock. So the thing that we're missing is that time and energy uh, in investment in creating stocks. So that's my check-in. Thanks for listening. I want to wait four or five minutes just to digest everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is that my check-in directly relates both to what you said and to some of the things Stuart touched on. Um, I really um, think I'll start with the with your comments because that's the more intellectual piece. I I was late because I was at the monthly Carnegie Senior Researcher staff meeting. And these are always the best part of the month. I mean, we have a chance to see who the new people are that have joined our team. And I was very excited to see that the Carnegie California Center, which just opened two weeks ago, has, recorded, has recruited three brilliant new people, including um, a woman who was at Kiva, the chief legal officer, and is now and then worked in the Oakland government. And she's somebody who's working on, you know, how technology can make regional governments more effective. And um, that's an aside, but it was just a sense of why I'm so proud of being part of Carnegie, because we're, we're not a typical think tank. First off, we're in six different places around the world. And now we have this California office to look at sub-regional politics. But we, we spent most of our time talking about the recent visit by Modi from India. And we, we have one of the most brilliant authors and thinkers, Ashley Tellis, 
who wrote a bunch of things about the visit. So if you want to understand what just happened and, and why it's so important, uh, I, I urge you to look at Ashley Tellis, T-E-L-L-I-S. And he also did some great podcasts. And so he's an example of where you have the, the stock, the articles, and the flow, because he does all these podcasts and discussion panels. But I've always found that that dichotomy kind of wrong because I, I focus on the on the distillation part, you know, of, of making those stocks high impact. So you got to I, I mean, I, I use the term bumper sticker, which sounds trivial, but so often the 10 page article will have an impact because somebody summarizes it in one sentence and a million people hear that one sentence and it changes their thinking. Uh, Ashley wrote this incredible piece for foreign affairs and the editor decided to entitle it America's bad oh. bet on India. Now, anybody who's followed Ashley's writing or read his new book knows that he doesn't see it as a good or a bad bet. I mean, he actually helped open up relations with China, with, a, with India back in the Bush administration. He's you know, a big advocate of closer relations. But his article said, look, you know, the U.S. thinks it's going to win India as a friend forever. And that's what he was referring to, that that's the bad bet. But the phrase bad bet has gotten everybody to pay attention to this article and in some cases change the way people think about the relationship. And, and so, as I said, that's, that's what I spend most, a lot of my time on is trying to take all this stuff going on on digital policy and geopolitics and put it into seven or eight words. So people will say, ah, I was thinking about it wrong. Or ah, I've got to go read that six page article. Of course, the other thing that's missing in the stocks and flows categorization is the connection that I need to find to all the people like Jerry. Uh, grande latte with cinnamon powder on it. Uh, uh, I don't think we need to know your coffee order. <laughs> but anyway. I couldn't get to the mute button fast enough. Anyway, it was... Uh, 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 interesting for me. And the reason this ties into my personal check-in is I don't do stocks very well. I mean, and partly my field is moving so fast, spending a whole hell of a lot of time to get the polished piece of prose about digital policy out to the world and then have it you know, completely overcome by events three months later it just doesn't seem as useful as talking to people and you know changing minds you know, 15 at a time in small group discussions. But it, I, I, I am judged by the people around me by how many words appear on the Carnegie website. And it, it, it's it's frustrating, frankly. I, I just don't, I don't, I write presentations well. I draft really well. I just can't get to the last 10% of the articles. And I'm, I've got about five articles right now that are in that last 10% phase. So that's my reflection on my current frustration and, and how I've got to sit down and just lock myself in a room until I do the last 10%. But the other totally unrelated piece of this is plays off of Stewart's piece. Uh, I, I have too many close relatives and friends right now who are suffering from a cascade of care. And this is what happens when, you know, a doctor says, oh, well, you have this uh, uh, problem focusing. Why don't you take this drug? Oh, but that drug is causing these other problems. Um, in one case, it's uh, an older person who's taking drugs for bone density. Well, this particular drug, unknowns to her, has a big impact on the integrity of your teeth. And the dentist that was working on her teeth didn't know this. So, you know, I, I'm just curious if anybody's seen a recent book or even a 10 page article on how in the hell can we get out of this situation where people are taking four or five drugs and 
and we're having all these weird side effects and cross effects. I, I particularly worry about my parents who are 89 and 86. And, you know, they're in a nursing home where it seems that they're paid by the pill to, to, to deliver these pills. And I, I just, I, I, I worry about whether my father's dementia is related to some of this. And um, it, it, it just, again, I mean, this is this is a bigger problem. I've been I've seen this for 30 years. Uh, I had a, a very I mean, long ago when I was in my 20s, I was treated for something and it turned out to be the treatment was so much worse than the disease. Um, but I, I, I don't see this as an issue and people aren't talking about it. And perhaps it's because they have no solution. And perhaps it's because the the economics of pharmaceuticals are driving people to create new drugs and more powerful drugs, and they're going to have more side effects. Um, any thoughts on that? And then the last thing is, is it back to some more good news. Um, I'm setting up for a trip to uh, uh, get out of Washington for a week with Kathleen, going to Knoxville, Asheville, Chapel Hill, and Roanoke, Virginia. If anybody has any interesting people or insights about those places. Then in September, we're going to Cyprus and Delphi, Greece. And then in uh, October, it looks like I'm headed to Taiwan, um, Sarawak, which is part of Malaysia, and Tokyo. So I've got some exciting travel coming up. Kevin Jones is in Australia. Oh, Nashville. Okay. That's good, Kevin. <laughs> might might drop by. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. There was a a piece on PBS yesterday about a young woman. I think she was in her early twenties, um, who died um, because she couldn't get uh, a bunch of specialists to talk to each other about her conditions. And she was on all kinds of different drugs that counteracted each other. Um, so I, I don't know. You might you might look there, um, but, but um, you know, when the other piece that pops up in response is the whole notion of, uh, as I understand it, the U.S. and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow. Um, TV advertising of drugs. And Big Pharma has become the greatest drug pusher <laughs> in the country. It's just, it's just amazing to watch the level of commercials um, about all these conditions that you know you never think you have. And then, you know, people who are sitting around depressed or in places of resignation think that that's going to be the, the thing that gets them out of it because they've identified some disease or condition that they have. And then there's the whole piece around identity, you know, which I've done some thinking about recently, people become their disease. Um, yes. And and that's their, you know, that becomes their identity, that becomes their life. Um, da, 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 da. So just a few random thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to play off your random thought, um, particularly elderly people, um, we are having we are having a reason to talk to the doctor was is a, is a reason for socialization. And they're so lonely. We are anyway. still in check in mode. Right. Um, so no back and forth, please, until we're done with everybody checking in. Uh, thank you. Greetings. Uh, our last Living Between Worlds call, we posed the question of what if you had to do something you didn't think you could do? It was specifically around climate change, the poly crisis, the meta crisis, whatever you want to frame it as. But, um, you know, like we are up against it as a species. 
I'm using we in the in the, the term of human beings here. We are um, we've put ourselves on the endangered species list, and we seem to be hell bent on becoming number one with a bullet. Ha ha. Um, when World War II broke out, and it's interesting, I just started watching Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States, which I highly recommend. It's pretty intense, but it's quite amazing. Um, when World War, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, you know, the automakers came to FDR and said, you know, we have this plan to transfer over and to transition over into making armaments in, in nine months. And FDR said, no, today, we start today, you know, and the comp everything regestalted, everything was oriented to the war effort. What's it going to take to orient everything to a life effort? And what if all of our thinking about what that's going to take is actually based on faulty assumptions? I'm really grappling with the worldview that I was inculcated into. Um, yesterday, we, Gil and I talked to a friend of ours who's become quite involved with uh, the Consilience Project and Daniel Smackenberger. And he said, you know, permacrisis, polycrisis, metacrisis, how do you distinguish them? And I thought they were all kind of the same thing. And he, he gave this great distinction of, you know, the polycrisis is, is a multi-centered crisis of interacting crises. And uh, the perma crisis is how permanent that is. And the meta crisis is what's the worldview that's bringing all that forth? And we always look to our white male ancestor. What would Socrates say? What would Einstein say? What if we started to look towards our indigenous ancestors? If we started to look towards the women who have contributed so much and never get credit for it? What if we started to look at, at the way that we're, you know, Mike, I don't mean to pick on you, but. You just mentioned you're going to be doing all this international travel. That's a really high carbon footprint. We cannot continue to operate as if, hey, I can just fly over where I want, you know? And um, it, I had to deal with, with some addiction issues in my 20s. I thought my world was going to end because it meant I had to completely change my behavior. It's like, how am I going to do that? I, 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 this is what I know. This is what I do. This is who I am. What am I going to do? How, you know? But I recognized what I who I thought I was, what I was doing was actually incredibly harmful to myself. And I had to make a complete 180 degree change. It was really hard, you know? And humans as a species have to make a very, very large change and it's gonna be really hard. And I have a feeling that we're gonna need not a whole lot of intellect, but a whole lot of, of compassion, a whole lot of heart, a whole lot of, of spiritual practice to understand grief and suffering. And uh, so it just, it orients me in a different direction. And I, I'm like, okay, what are, the, what are the assumptions I have about my life and my place in the world that are faulty, not serving? And that's not an easy thing to look at. You know, it's, it's very, very challenging work. Um, so I, we have to do that together. And I don't see... You know, I've been aware, I read Bucky Fuller's Critical Path in 1987. That was kind of my wake up call in my life. Like, holy cow, there's a world out there I had no idea about, you know? And then in the early 90s, I got involved in the deep ecology movement. And that was when I started to look at, wow, we're really in an unadvantaged, dangerous path. And I've been sitting with this for over 30 years now. And it's really uncomfortable making, and it's not nearly uncomfortable making enough to make me get rid of my car. And, you know, I'm going to live in a house with that's heat and, and, you know, I'm, I'm in an unsustainable paradigm. How do I live in an unsustainable paradigm in a way that doesn't make it worse that actually might make it a little better. And how do I speak with people who say, no, no, don't worry. You know, climate change has been going on for years. I have a, I have a meme of a two frogs sitting in a pot and one's going, don't worry. Temperature goes up and down in here all the time, you know? Um, so what do we do? How do we do that without, alienating people without saying the way you're living is is completely unsustainable from an ecological standpoint. You have to change and not make them wrong for that and not judge them for that and invite them into a conversation where they actually want to examine their assumptions in a way that could lead to change. That's a tough nut to crack. And I think that's walking up the river to change that stone, to change the course of the river. That's a place to go. That's a leverage point, but it's really, really challenging to do that. So that's what I'm thinking about lately. Thank you for listening.
Um, I'm going to keep my comment short. I wasn't going to comment at all, but in response to what Mike had to say, um, my response is a little bit overwhelming because I have, I feel exactly how Klaus feels, but about a different subject. And the subject that's getting me down is I see something, I see a major problem that has to do with the pharmaceutical industry and the hospitals. Um, there are two books I want to call attention to. One is by a man by the name of Rob Wypont. It's called Your, Your Consent is Not Required, and it has to do with forced hospitalizations. The other one is by an attorney by the name of Jim Gottstein, and it's called The Zyprexa Papers. And this was uncovering of the corruption, I believe it was Eli Lilly, and the problems that the drugs were causing in the patients that it was being given to. And there's evidence that these kinds of drugs given for mental health actually hurt the prognosis of the people that it's being given to. Um, today, I got a call by somebody that was forcibly brought to the hospital and then released. Um, yesterday, I was on a call and I continue to be part of this ongoing group. It's mostly lawyers that are working for the civil rights of people whose civil rights are being violated because they have a diagnosis. And it, there are no regulatory agencies that are making sure that the hospitals are following the rules and regulations for confinements. And as long as these people have Medicaid or some other insurance that's paying for it, their rights are being totally violated. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine who was a social worker yesterday, and she told me about a friend whose 12 year old child was kept in an emergency room pod for four weeks. That is traumatizing to a child. These things feel overwhelming to me. Number one, I'm a very sensitive person, but the like knowing that there, there's no help out there. And people, first of all, because of HIPAA laws, it's hard to find the other people to be able to gather together and have strength in numbers. Then because of the shame and the stigma around it, it's hard to gather them together. Um, the lawyers work for the hospitals, so it's hard to get legal representation. This scares me because of what I see happening in politics, because of the abuse that is happening. It is 30 times more profitable than locking people away in prisons. So I will stop for now and I'll try to get some um, resources together and put them in the chat in the matter most, but I just couldn't let that go. So thank you, Mike, for bringing it up because it really weighs heavy on me. Is there anyone present who hasn't checked in who would like to check in? I think, uh, Eric, you said you're in viewer mode today, which is great. I think the rest of us have gone. Uh, Carl has not. Uh, actually, Mark, I think you said you were in viewer mode. Eric, I don't know that you did. We'll just quickly talk a little bit. Um, so um, one idea that I've been playing with I mentioned in chat is like breaking a transcript of a YouTube video into five minute segments and feeding each segment to chat GPT and seeing what kind of summary I get. I tried it with like 10 minutes and then it got confused. So I think five minutes is the right dosage. And uh, the theory is that it's trying to match more than necessary and it gets, it doesn't find matches. So, yeah, now that could be automated. Um, and um, like it could also produce audio. But so I've just put these ideas out there, but uh, I don't know exactly how to put it all together. So, um, and I've been 
was doing a lot with my uh, vintage computers, um, doing so I could build a whole internet with the Apple computers now. <laughs> uh, there's a new little device that can do networking. But uh, yeah, I keep thinking about the big problems too, uh, the dynamic knowledge repositories that we, we should have, but don't yet after 50 years. <laughs> um, but basically I need to uh, yeah, really take care of myself and uh, just you know, figure out where I'm, and, and just day, day by day, that's what it is. Uh, little improvements here and there. Thanks. Um, before you go, Gil, Carl, did you want to check in? We're just doing a check-in round. You came in a little bit late, but uh, if you'd like to, this uh, this is the moment. Okay. Yeah. Just um, taking care of some issues. I guess if healthcare is the part of the topic I spent, uh, I made about five or six appointments. Now I've been um, neglecting stuff because of all the craziness with my dad and home care, but um, yeah, it's, it's getting there. In fact, I was just at the bank, which is why I was late, so clearing up some things for my father. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I actually bought the family home. So and, and things. So hopefully things will settle down, and I can get back to doctoral research and things. And then I did post on LinkedIn and stuff. But we've got the deputy CIO of um, General Services Administration. The the position's open until um, July 21st. So if you've got people who qualify, um, definitely it's an incredible place to, to work. We're really at the center of everything as far as like data, data.gov and all these different things. So um, that'll stop. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. I'll step in and play moderator again. Gil, the floor is yours. Oh, well. Carl, I hope you'll carry our blessings with you as you navigate this. This is challenging stuff. Um, a whole thread of thinking rising in me, uh, Mike, provoked by your sharing. Um, um, man, it's complicated. Uh, talk about messes. Um, I was managing my dad's care during the last few years of his life, and he was on, I think, at one point, 16 different medications. Um, all of which, of course, had interactions, uh, more than he could keep track of. So I had to manage, you know, the inventorying and the scheduling and the dosing. It was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Um, and of course, the doctors didn't talk to each other. So there was nobody managing the interactions, uh, except occasionally when he was hospitalized, there was a guy called a hospitalist who was designed to be a point of integration and was wicked smart, but very rare. Um, and um, um, so, yeah, so you're in that. And, you know, at, at one level, I think about it as, as the mechanistic worldview run amok dealing with complex adaptive systems. You know, let's poke this thing here and see what happens. Um, um, and it's very hard to resist because they will tell you, and it might be true that you will die if you don't take this medication. Um, and, um, you know, Stuart, you're entering into this conversation. My wife has been in it for years. Um, and in a constant reconsideration for her of should I go, should I be taking these drugs or not yeah I might die sooner if I don't but what's my quality of life if I do and none of it is certain anyway uh, and so it's there's kind of a constant question um, so we've got this mechanistic worldview of complex adaptive systems plus we've got private equity 
which has been crawling over this industry and producing, you know, the messes that Stacy was talking about and others. Um, um, uh, I think there's a project for Carnegie, if you're not already doing it, which is, um, you know, given that the United States and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow public drug advertising. It's not, not like ask your doctor about this condition, ask your doctor about this drug. Your doctor's got 10 minutes with you. And you come in saying, give me this. And a lot of doctors are going to say, well, okay. Um, you know, this is strangely a place where AI may actually be helpful to be able to map the interactions and feed um, some perspective or suggestions to doctors. But I'm struck by a couple of things. One is that um, um, my sister-in-law, who's lived in France for 30 years and has raised two children and buried a husband and lived through breast cancer, um, has never seen a medical bill and has never seen a piece of paper. She just get, walks in and gets care. And the care is half the cost per capita is in the United States and medical outcomes are better. So there's that. And there's, you know, there's a boatload of work to do there. But the, you know, the drug advertising might be an interesting place for you guys to poke uh, and see what happens. Um, um, you know, for, for, for Jane and me, our basic response to the mechanistic versus integrated perspective is to choose a, a very deep practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture is kind of the leading edge of that as our primary care provider. Uh, we still have doctors, we still have health insurance, we still do stuff in the system, but our starting point is someone who has a comprehensive view of the living system as a self-healing system. And we, all, and we always start there and reference everything there. <clears throat> um, last thing, um, and thank you for permitting, permitting me to go along here. I was on a webinar yesterday that was quite remarkable a group called R3.0 um, out of um, Europe and the US, which has been doing some very um, rigorous systems work around sustainability and corporate sustainability and policy and building white papers and tools and so forth. Um, had an exploratory call yesterday that started with the premise that this whole mess, uh, you know, sustainability, climate, ESG, da, 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 is really about love. And entered into a conversation about love among people and love in organizations. And I'm a little uncomfortable with the direction that they're heading because it seems to be building an instrument to measure love and enterprise. I think some things don't get to get measured. Um, but um, the instrument might also be valuable in just bringing the question to the fore and having, helping people think about what's going on here among us and with me. And is there love here? And what is driving us? And the reason I raise it is because I found myself, aside from all my specific questions and concerns, I found myself in an, in an utterly remarkable mood that I couldn't even name. But I was in a mood that I've never been, I spend a lot of time in these things like you all do. I, it was a mood that I've never been in. It was a tenderness and a reflection. Uh, and, um, and so the question, um, the question is is alive with me. It's threading through my conversation with Ken and living between worlds and a kinship worldview, uh, which is one of the perspectives on the indigenous wisdom that Ken's been talking about. Um, and it's just, you know, what if we noticed love and what if we presenced love in more and more and more of our lives, even the places where it seems like it has no place? I've spoken. Uh, Stuart, then Doug, and take your time stepping in. Yeah, so two thoughts. Um, and I'll come back to what Gil finished with. Um, but in terms of medical system, yeah. Um, I, I think of my acupuncturist as a primary care. <laughs> and the other folks are doing that mechanical stuff but what i what i thought about as we were talking was it's an interesting phenomenon kaiser's got a pretty good um interactive um system to communicate with docs 
but you can't communicate with two at a time. You can only communicate with one. In other words, you can't copy two other doctors on an important conversation that needs a level of integration. <laughs> and, and that's obviously by design, you know, obviously by design. It's not, it's not by um, omission. Um, well, Stuart, I have, I have actually sent emails complaining to Kaiser and engaged them because they use Epic. There are basically Cerner and Epic are the duopoly of hospital information systems. And I sent them a note saying, hey, Kaiser, your software sucks. Aren't you old enough and big enough to have built your own really good one? Could you go over, go over and look at Global Vista, which is different and better? Um, and they've kind of engaged a little bit, but they don't know what to do with the complaint about their user experience. But this is really important because I find that their software falls apart all over the place. And I do like Kaiser. So sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, I saw the same thing. And I was like, people, you're stupid. Stop doing this. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing about which ties into Gil's surfacing love um, when I was doing a lot of divorce mediation, and it's congruent with my, my conflict resolution models for conversation, conversational models, I would sit with a couple, and I wouldn't get near any of the, quote, articulated issues that they were fighting about, you know, custody, visitation, money, blah, 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 until I drilled down and had a series of questions in a dialogue model that were designed to surface compassion and love and get them to see that other human being over there that at one time they were in love with enough to marry and have kids with. I'll tie that into Klaus's um, check in about the you know, food service industry and, and what's going on with clear cutting. I guarantee you that um, all those companies have articulated values <laughs> that are lip service to some of the things that we're talking about. And so in some ways, I, I would suggest that as a, as a facilitation model, before you start arguing about the concepts and ideas, that you bring people back to those articulated values and try to see their actions through the lens of those values as you know things to evaluate. I'm not saying that that's going to work, but I'm just saying it's it's something that that can be useful to you know just just to bring up because um, in some ways you know if you do that in an artful way we're all um, human beings, and I think so many, so many people are feeling the level of frustration now, but they're just not sure what else to do. You know, people on a rat wheel, they just can't get off the fucking rat wheel. Um, and yeah, and one more thing, um, and I put this in um, <laughs> in the chat when Pete was talking about, you know, creating a a body of knowledge someplace, you know. Um, I'm someone who avoided writing. <laughs> I got an undergraduate education with writing one paper. <laughs> and, then I, and then I got to law school and I had to write a huge research paper for the dean. And my first draft got totally and completely destroyed. I never saw so much red ink. I said, shit, these people are serious about writing. And I ended up, you know, as a as the student writing editor of the Law Review, you know, coaching and teaching others how to write, because I was able to turn around my my experience and realize a lot of stuff about the writing process. Um, it's a craft, it's an iteration. And it it clarifies ideas, and 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 is a is a great learning process. as a wonderful way to hold it. And then you get something that is, um, and especially if you have multiple people working on a piece, you get something that is 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 um, is very very solid. And that's one of the things that I've decided to do lately. 
just to get this work out in the world. I don't care who publishes it. Um, doesn't matter. It's not that important. I just need to get it out before I die, which is not going to be anytime soon. Thank you. Mr. Homer, at your leisure. Or leisure. Uh, I forgot when I was doing my check-in, something that was actually very poignant for me this week. Um, I never knew my grandparents. My, my father's dad died before uh, I was born and his mom died when I was about three and he didn't like his in-laws. So I barely knew my, my mother's parents. But when I was a kid, my aunt and uncle had a house in Sac Harbor, Long Island and I spent all my summers out there. And there was an old sea captain next door. His name was Captain Peters. And he was my grandfather figure. Um, and this man just, he, he could seemingly do everything anything and everything he just he was he was really an amazing guy and this week i started to poke around the internet see what i could find out about him and i came across this story that i just put in the in the chat this mariners museum if you have three minutes just read this story it is astounding i never knew this the man had his ship torpedoed out from under him and he rescued all of his men had a broken leg the oil covered everything he after he got all his men off the ship he climbed back up an oil covered ladder with a broken leg to get the secret papers so they wouldn't fall into nazi hands i mean i, I was in awe reading this story it's this amazing thing so i just want to put that in there as a as something that's actually quite positive um so enjoy that at your at your leisure or leisure as you as you prefer pleasure or pleasure exactly and i do have a poem but i still have a few minutes so i'll wait till the end or i can do that now whatever you like I'm thinking dose of poetry right now would be welcome and lovely. And once again, it's one of these things where this poem came up this week and I'm listening to this call and it seems really apropos. It's called Five Ways to Kill a Man by Edwin Brock. <clears throat> there are many cumbersome ways to kill a man. You could make him carry a plank of wood to the top of a hill and nail him to it. To do this properly, you require a crowd of people wearing sandals, a cock that crows, a cloak to dissect, a sponge, some vinegar, and one man to hammer the nails home. Or you could take a length of steel, shaped and chased in the traditional way, and attempt to pierce the metal cage he wears. But for this, you need white horses, English trees, men with bows and arrows, at least two flags, a prince and a castle to hold your banquet in. Dispensing with nobility, you may, if the wind allows, blow gas at him. But then you need a mile of mud sliced through with ditches, not to mention black boots, bomb craters, more mud, a plague of rats, a dozen songs, and some round hats made of steel. In the age of airplanes, you may fly miles above your victim and dispose of him by pressing one small switch. All you then require is an ocean to separate you, two systems of government, a nation's scientists, several factories, a psychopath, and land that no one needs for several years. There are, as I began, cumbersome ways to kill a man. Simpler, direct, and much more neat is to see that he lives somewhere in the middle of the 20th century and leave him there. That is a sizzling, spanking, awesome poem, Ken. Thank you so much for bringing it to this room. Amazing, isn't it? That's a mind blower. You just didn't see it coming in that last, ah, just get you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Klaus, whenever you feel like stepping in. Yeah, you know, I was, uh... I wanted to follow up on this discussion about love and the surprise that, that this is indeed uh, the most powerful uh, driving force in humanity because it's the oldest topic of humanity, right? Tolstoy uh, has, in my mind, done uh, the most profound work in summarizing um, how love and empathy empathy really not uh, uh, maybe a better term 
um, is really the clue that holds uh, civilizations together, that holds human uh, groupings together. So every religion, and I put in a, a quick uh, um, summary from uh, chat GPT here on you know, what is uh, reciprocal altruism in love, and you can see in each religion, this is the central theme. So why should this surprise us, right? I mean, it's just like, how did this happen? Um, the question just arises, why uh, does uh, empathy not dominate our political process, you know, our companies, our, I mean, if we know with such certainty, right, because it is, you can't be more certain about anything we know about ourselves as human beings um, than that that empathy and love is the critical uh, emotion, critical um, way of being, you know, to have a successful uh, uh, togetherness. So why uh, uh, is this not a central theme in our conversations and discussions and in our political process? Because clearly, we're running into the opposite direction. Um, so, so that, so, so it, it hit me as a surprise, Gil, to to you know that this was a surprise, you know, and and um, and and I would just, oh God, how do you get this uh, uh, more into the public psyche? I mean, when you look at Christians, right? Uh, uh, following Trump and, you know, getting getting so enraged with their culture themes. You couldn't be more misguided about what is the central theme of your faith and your belief. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm glad it surfaces. Um, I'm, I, I find it more disturbing that it, it is not like right at the front of our mind, you know, right at the at the center of our consciousness. Thank you, Klaus. I will say perhaps overly optimistically that it seems to me that, and this may sound strange, that Joe Biden's strategy into the next electoral cycle and in his administration seems to be to love his enemies and try to love everybody and just try to go do some stuff. Again, I may be being overly optimistic here, but it, I think he is doing that in part because of its sharp contrast against the strategies of hatred and and uh, uh, everything else that the other side appears to have gone all in on. Uh, Mark, you may have the last uh, the last word today. We're getting close to the end of our time. Um, from a communications um, engineering standpoint, love takes more communication. And division or hate or um it takes a heck of a lot less and so there's an entropy kind of um energy uh equation how are we going to basically you know put in more work that it takes i remember an amazing dating statistic that people more easily communicate and bond about what they mutually don't like than what they mutually like. And so um, thank you for the Maturana article, um, Gil. Um, very interesting. And um, I uh, certainly uh, have enough difficulty with love between two people, much less within the organizations that I interact with. Um, but uh, here's love coming at you, everybody on this call. Thank you. And I just want to echo that by saying we had a funny, slow, bumpy start today. And I just appreciate y'all's patience just sitting there with it and letting it kind of roll out and letting us get to where we got, which is someplace really interesting. There are multiple people said things today that I just I will be stewing on and going back to um we're right at time it seems like a good place to wrap i am grateful for your presence 
and uh, we'll see you on the inner tubes. Next week is uh, five minute universities. I will lock that in now. Uh, Gil, you had asked which format we're using. It's not uh, Howard Rheingold's uh, format. It's a different one, which is uh, whoever wants to present on something that they know something about or care about. And it could be anything. It could be in any domain that they'd like to share. It has five minutes and precisely five minutes to explain it. And, and they could use a deck. They could not use a deck, probably easier without a deck. Uh, but five minutes, and then we do five minutes of Q&A, and then we cut it off, and anybody who wants to keep asking questions, you know exactly whom to talk to, then we bounce to the next person, so I will create a queue for who, who uh, has offered to uh, be in there. Uh, Eric, if you want to put people to sleep in five minutes, you can do that, and like, if you wanted to hold up a little thing and hypnotize us, give that a go, I don't know, I don't know, but uh, next week is Five Minute Universities, and uh, thank you all. The Beatles came up in response to um, Mark. Go listen to All You Need Is Love. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>